Hello Global Gardeners, it's Monday, it's gardening time, it's our favorite time of the week and I love being here to talk gardening for the next 90 minutes and it's going to be hopefully an uplifting show today because we're going to talk about the things that are going right in the garden and it's not just about my garden it's also what's going right in your garden so let's share our thoughts share our questions and most importantly share our tips and successes so that we can all learn from each other let's go ahead and get started with a question from aileen d what should i do with brown stink bugs and my peppers they seem to especially love my shishito peppers and the green stock for the most part, stink bugs are more of a nuisance than anything else. If, they're, if they arrive in large numbers, then yeah, they can be a problem. Because if they are kind of located just with your green stock, you have a much better chance of keeping them under control. Most stink bugs, I just try to grab. They'll, they'll try to jump away, but I grab them and squish them and just try to keep their numbers low. You can look for eggs. Kaolin clay is something you can actually apply on leaves to help keep them from laying eggs and eating the leaves. But for the most part, I just try to pluck them off. The nice thing about something like stink bugs is there are a lot of natural predators. So in general, in a garden, the more flowers you can grow, the more herbs you can grow, the more grasses, the, the weeds around the area, all those native plants. Get as many different plants growing in your area to attract those beneficial predators, and they'll help keep your stink bug, bugs under control. This year, I'm seeing very little insect activity in my garden because, as I've been talking about for the three years I've been building my garden, I have all the flowers and the herbs and the grasses and I'm letting the natural predators deal with the pests that show up and I'm not seeing many pests. So that's how I, t I tend to deal with the stink bugs is not worry too much about them. Try to, to pluck, <coughs> excuse me, pluck them off. But then also, and this may actually help benefit you as well if you have your green stock on a patio or a deck is keep the area around your plants clean. The stink bugs are looking for a place to shelter, and so they're going to hide under leaves and branches and anything that you have just lying around the garden. So keep your garden clean, pluck them off, and hopefully that'll help. And then kind of along those same lines, surely is that is saying i'm new to gardening don't know what i'm doing and i'm a little discouraged first off don't be discouraged that happens we all have issues i have white fly infestation in my garden and i really don't want to use insecticides and so kind of like the stink bugs white flies generally are more of a nuisance than an insect that causes a lot of damage and I've seen a lot of the comments going back and forth about the white flies. It's all great information. I tend to uh, agree with what Laurelful is saying, that get some uh, soapy water, knock bugs into it. This works great for both the, <laughs> the white flies and the stink bugs. But the thing I like best is also with Laurelfly or Laurelful is the yellow sticky traps. A couple years ago, I did a couple of videos, actually. You could see the yellow sticky traps that I was using then. And it's a very effective way to deal with those small, nuisance insect pests like the white flies. You can use neem oil. You can use insecticidal soaps. You need to make sure you spray the top of the leaves and the bottom of the leaves. But I tend to be too lazy to do that. So the yellow sticky traps is really the best way I like to, to deal with the white flies and all of those little nuisance bugs. So, okay, I'm scrolling down to try to catch up. Hey, Pat, thanks for that contribution. Greetings from Trinidad, Colorado, down the road a ways. It's great to have you here, alleging to be 5B, but I agree. Lately, I'm not sure. So, 
uh, just a, a brief notion, in the summer, your zone doesn't make any difference because the zones are based on the coldest average winter temperature. And here in Colorado, it's been warm in the winter. But I've been tracking this the last three years that I've been in this house. I'm in zone 5B, which means my coldest average winter temperature is minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus 26 Celsius. And we've had very few days this last winter that were below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Very few. But this last winter and the winter before and the winter before that had one day where it got down to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And so while I think the winters in general, and I agree with Pat, are getting warmer, and I would not be surprised if our zone changes when the USDA updates the map, who knows when. Because we've had one day that is that cold, that effectively defines our entire zone. So it's kind of crazy that we're seeing a lot of the temperature variation and weather variations all over the place. But all it takes is one day in the winter to define our zone. And it's kind of crazy that that's the, the way it looks at, or it looks in our gardens is that one day can define everything, which is why we need to learn as much as we can about all the other things going on so that our garden is defined how we want to define it, not by a single day of cold weather. That's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Sunset Gazing is cooking up some sweet potato vines that are tasty. That's that's awesome. I'm, I'm scrolling down trying to find a comment that, that Brian made because I think it's absolutely fantastic and I may have already passed by it. But Brian mentioned that he had harvested a whole bunch of his tomatoes because he just had a ton of rain over the last couple of days. I think that is a fantastic idea. And that's the kind of stuff I want to focus on today are the things that you're doing that are right and that are working. And so when a tomato is, is fruiting, as that fruit is growing, nice, consistent moisture is what we want. And the tomato fruit will gradually grow. The skin will gradually exp expand. The flesh inside will gradually reach a point that it maxes out. The tomato is not going to get any bigger, and that's when the color change starts happening and it becomes the tomato you're looking for, and then you harvest it and then you eat it. That's the normal progression. But before that tomato reaches its, its full maturity and you're harvesting it, there is a point where the skin is done stretching and it, bega it begins to harden. Normally, the flesh inside stays at that size. But if you have three inches of rain over a two-day period, all of that water that's going into the soil suddenly has to go somewhere. And the plant is like, oh, wow, look at all this water. And it sucks up all the water. And it can go into the fruit, causing that flesh inside to expand and the skin has nowhere to go, and it splits. So split tomatoes is often caused by a quick abundance of moisture. And so great idea, Brian, to bring in your tomatoes when you saw that rain coming to keep the tomatoes from splitting. So I love that tip. That's a real good, good way to, to get into the topic of the day is to... Think about those kind of things and learn from someone. So if your tomatoes are on the vine and you've got a whole bunch of rain forecast and they're getting close to harvest time, go ahead and harvest them early to avoid the, the split because split tomatoes, while still edible, don't store very well. You need to eat them right away. So if you want to store your tomatoes, definitely harvest them a little bit early. Uh, Yankee Sister Homestead, nice to see you here today. Hello back to you, and yes, a shout out to Heidi and Jay, our fabulous moderators who are already on and participating. So nice to see everybody here. And so uh, Peggy cooked up the radish scapes, amazing sauteed and fresh 
garden salad. I've, I've done the garlic scapes. I actually haven't done radishes, though all parts of the radish are edible. So good for you. That's a great, great idea. <coughs> and so uh, start throwing your stuff out at me. Let's see what other things you might have. Anita B, good morning to you as well. Don't worry about running late because the peppers need to be harvested. Good for you. I've got a couple peppers that I could actually harvest, but I'm going to let them change color and get to, to uh, full maturity. But you're right, that is a good problem to have. So as I scroll down, Bohemian Herbology and Natural Solutions is here. Laurelful has been very active. Judy Hobbs says, um, I've had beetles on my... Um, not sure what that is. Haven't had those in years. I had one big tomato hornworm on a tomato plant. Cut that stem off with him on it and haven't seen any more. And the tomato plant lived. That's great. Yeah, it's uh, a few of you talking about taking the tomato hornworms and feeding them to chickens as well. Chickens love the tomato hornworms. They turn into beautiful moths, but um, they're just such a pain to have on the tomatoes. You can just pluck them off, Judy. You don't need to cut off the stem you may not want to handle that big worm or that big caterpillar because it will fight back uh, but you don't have to cut off the whole stem you can just take the caterpillar throw it into some soapy water throw it into some chickens throw it into the street but get it away from your tomatoes dusty flats why do tomatoes and cucumber leaves get spots and yellow leaves starting at the bottom of the plant late summer great question and so this actually um, leads into a good excuse to prune the lower leaves of your tomatoes and peppers when you start seeing this happen. And the same with cucumbers. So as the plant grows, it needs more and more energy. And the initial root development is really going to set the stage for how well the plant does over the course of the growing season. And so if you do everything great, and you get some really good root development, you're setting yourself up for a really good plant. With taller plants and bigger plants, this might happen a little bit later. With stunted or stressed plants, it may happen a little bit sooner. But at some point, the root structure just isn't enough to support the entire plant. And so what happens is the plant shuts off those lower, older leaves just cuts them off, says, I don't need you anymore. I'm putting all of my energy into new growth, into flowers, into the fruit development. And so later in the season, with that last burst of growth, with those flowers, with that fruit, that's where the plant's energy is going. And it sacrifices leaves so that all that energy is directed to where it wants the, the propagation to continue for that plant. So that's why they, they start yellowing and they'll either fall off or you can pull them off and it's perfectly normal. It's, it's really nothing that's wrong. If it's only the bottom leaves that are turning yellow and the top is still nice and green and healthy, that's, that's what you should expect with your plants. With weakened plants or stressed plants, what will often happen is, is the plant does that. It sacrifices those, those older, lower leaves. And if the root system isn't enough to support the flowers and the fruiting, then you may notice some of the other leaves start to yellow and maybe the, the new growth isn't as strong and green as it should be. But uh, if, it's, if it's starting at the bottom in late summer, uh, I use that as an opportunity to prune those lower leaves and get some more air circulation because it's late in summer that you're going to start getting some of those fungal diseases uh, like powdery mildew and a lot of those can be reduced by just improving the air circulation in your plants. So those yellow leaves aren't providing any assistance to the plant. So go ahead and get rid of them and you don't have to wait for them to fall off. Just go ahead and prune them off. And, and that's why I say I use that as a clue that, oh, hey, I could probably do a little pruning on my plants and improve the air circulation. Hi, Lama Lama. Discovered my garden after 10 p.m. is very different. Found a scorpion, two camel spiders, a few wolf spiders, and frogs every other step. That's, that's great. No gardening after 10. I, and when I was gardening in Oklahoma, 
uh, I went out a few evenings and that's what I saw as well. Lots of scorpions outside, lots of spider activity outside, and a lot of other insect activity outside. So uh, yeah, you want to see something different about your garden, get out there in the evening and, and see what's going on. Uh, okay, so I want to, oh, there's Lisa Potter. Let's go ahead and recognize that first. Garden looks amazing. Thank you. Uh, I'll talk about this here in just a little bit. I thought it was appropriate for today's subject to, to show you my garden and talk about some of my successes. And and uh, I'm just so happy with it. Thanks for all your great teaching. Thank you, Lisa. I, I, I appreciate that. And so uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to try to scroll down and catch up. Uh, there's Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen, for that super chat. Haven't been able to join live stream lately, so want to show my appreciation. We'll share about Galileo Moon on the Facebook group soon. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my, my Galileo Moon tomatoes. Hopefully you'll see a video on that, but yeah, I look forward to hearing about that as well, Gretchen. And thank you for being here. Thank you for the participation and the donation. And so let me talk a little bit about some of my successes. And one, something I hadn't seen before. And so tied in with, with the, the bug problems you might have in your garden, those insect pests, I try to balance my garden with nature. And one of the ways I do that is try to attract birds because birds will eat insects while they're nesting. About 90% of bird species eat insects when they're nesting. So I have bird feeders in, in the background. You can't really see them right here, but that's where I have my bird feeders. I have um, bird houses and a couple different areas of my garden. So I attract the birds with bird feeders and with the bird houses, and the birds help take care of some of the insect problems in the garden. Wow, I saw something this week I haven't seen before. I, I just thought it was incredible but it shows how all these different pieces can work together and so in one of my uh, birdhouses on this shed are some house sparrows and there are baby birds in in the nest in the house and the parents are flitting back and forth all through the day feeding those little birds you know that that by itself is incredible to watch because you can hear the little birds chirping when the parents arrive with the food and so i noticed how fast they were going back and forth well it turns out that one of the parents was just flitting from this shed to the bird feeder and back and forth and back and forth and i'm guessing taking some of those black sunflower seeds i have in the bird feeder and feeding the chicks the other adult was flying over the garden and out to the front and would be gone for a minute or two before coming back. So I think one of them was catching insects and bringing the insects back. And the other was going back and forth to the bird feeder. And I just was so fascinated by that idea that the bird feeder had attracted them. And then they found the place to nest. And then they're using the whole garden environment to include the bird feeder to feed their chicks. So uh, I hadn't seen that before. I just always figured that they were, were plucking the insects or the seeds from the ground to feed the babies, not straight from the bird feeder. So I thought I would share that because I just, I just thought that, that was incredible, really. So of course I've been working harder to keep my bird feeder filled for them and for the other birds. And so, um, what else do you have? Go ahead and uh, Pat Patrick says, just got my copy of Tony's book, Composting Masterclass. Wow, exclamation point. Outstanding addition to my garden library. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this last week. Definitely put that in the, the success category. The things that went right is getting that book because it really is a benefit to the garden. And it is one of those things that once you have it, uh, it is something you should definitely want to, to look through and use it as a resource. Rita says, good morning. I have the same wind condition as you did. Uh, how did I anchor the greenhouse? <coughs> and so my greenhouse back here, that's a plant of greenhouse. Uh, its design actually has legs about uh, 15 to 18 inches long. 
with a T at the bottom. And so it's designed to either screw onto a foundation of some type, or as I did to put those legs on and then dig an 18 inch deep hole and bury the legs. And because it's got that T piece at the bottom, once those legs are buried, they're not going anywhere. And so uh, the way this greenhouse works is at each, so on the end, and then at that band, and then at that band, and then another band, and then another end. So on each side, I've got five legs that are buried with that cross brace at the bottom, and that's what's holding it in place. So the, the structure itself is designed to withstand wind, but with the legs buried, it's anchored. And then on the, the sides, each side has a door uh, on the legs underneath the door frame, I actually poured concrete into those holes. So the side holes is uh, the, the side holes are buried just with regular soil and then the end legs are buried in concrete and it is solid. So I'll be showing you that. Um, I've got the footage shot. I just haven't edited it to show you how I built the greenhouse and how I put it all together. I've got some more inside stuff that I want to finish before I actually um, finish the video. But uh, yeah, you'll be able to see all that in the future. Lily's saying, my green bean plants are huge and full of flowers, but very few beans. Why? It could be summer heat. Beans can handle a good amount of heat, but if it gets too hot, the pollen may, may die. Uh, pollen can actually die when the temperature gets above 90 degrees Fahrenheit about 32 degrees Celsius. And so everything else could be great, including the pollinators, but the pollen itself just may not be viable to produce the, the pods and the development of, of fruit on all kinds of different plants. So yet again, I, I'm often suggesting that you consider shade cloth if you have a very hot area. So that, that's probably the most likely reason um, beans can pollinate themselves, so they're not reliant on pollinators. Uh, get in, you know, as long as there's a little bit of a breeze and maybe some insects and you brushing by the plants, that's usually enough to pollinate. But if the beans themselves uh, are not appearing and the flowers are dropping off, it's usually hot, dry, windy conditions, and it becomes a pollen issue in the flowers rather than anything you're doing. So hopefully as temperatures cool, you'll see more of the beans start to start to develop. Okay, Yogi says, I think squirrels ate my beans. They definitely ate some of the sunflower heads and I watched them steal plums daily. <laughs> Fattest, happiest squirrels. Sounds like happy squirrels. And so uh, what, I, what I usually suggest, and you may have heard this before, is, is if you give them food to, food to eat, they'll stay fat and happy eating that food. And if it's something you don't want them to eat, then give them that food someplace else. And so in one corner of your, your yard, put some plums and put some sunflower heads and put all those things that they can eat easily without being threatened by hawks or anything that might fly by. And they'll tend to leave the rest of the garden alone because they're lazy, like most of the rest of us, and they'll eat that easy, lazy food as opposed to venturing out into the garden where they could run into some, some potential problems. Uh, and so uh, I I've actually have seen some squirrels in the trees in my neighbor right here, but same kind of thing. She's got fruit food that it's not necessarily for the squirrels, but the squirrels would rather stay in the trees and eat her yard than to venture into mine. And even though I've got a lot more in my garden than she does, I don't have a squirrel problem at all because Mala helps keep them away. The hawks and the owls help keep them away because, you know, this is a pretty wide open area that they would have to traverse to get to my garden. You can use that same concept to your benefit and uh, keep them in an area where you can monitor them and they'll stay away from your garden without too much issue. 
So CC says, I planted beans, it's supposed to be a prolific plant, but none of my six plants or seed, seeds sprouted. I soaked them and didn't add any soil amendments. Could that have molded? So um, soaking beans is, is a good thing. I, I am growing a bunch of pinto beans right now. I soaked them all overnight. You'll see that in a future video as well. And that's typically a way to do it. Now, I would, I would say consider your source of beans because of the many plants I grow, beans often have the lowest germination rate. Not necessarily a zero rate, but a low germination rate. And so it could be your seeds. Uh, it shouldn't be the, the soil amendments because the seed has everything it needs to sprout. And so it will germinate and start growing regardless of the soil it's growing in. It'll do it on a wet paper towel. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be the, the soil amendments unless your soil has been contaminated with an herbicide of some type, in which case it would kill off the seedling as, as soon as it starts growing. So if none of the six sprouted, uh, I would suggest that it may just be bad seed because you should have had some germination and the soaking should have helped. So try it again. Try doing some more beans, maybe from a different source, and maybe you'll have better luck because it is one of those things that uh, should be easy to grow. And if it's not easy to grow, I usually attribute it to the seed. Vanessa has ants moved in next to the orange tree. Help. I don't know that you need help. I, I think ants are okay in the garden. I actually have lots of ants in my garden right now. And I think that's a good thing because I've got really hard packed dense soil. And every time ants move in and dig a little mound, they're helping to aerate the soil and help water and all that organic matter flow into their nests, into my soil and improve my soil. They are also can be fairly effective pollinators. So on a citrus tree, if they get on your tree, they're probably seeking out any aphids that might be on there. They like the honeydew that the, the aphids secrete, but they're not going to eat the, the fruit. They're not going to eat the flowers and they can actually help pollinate a lot of plants in our garden as they're crawling back and forth. So I wouldn't automatically assume, Vanessa, that that's a bad thing. And, and you might actually uh, just accept it because they're going to be aerating the soil around the tree, which will help the roots and the, the soil as well. So uh, I, 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 I think really the only ant issues are if you have fire ants that will, that will bite you when you go out into the garden. Other than that, I encourage ants, just like I encourage birds and I encourage the insect pests so that they can encourage the beneficial predators everything in balance if you if you get rid of the ants you're actually going to be affecting some of those other uh, life forms in the garden that will eat the ants and and it can throw everything off balance so yeah don't get too concerned with the, the ants so Gradina is wondering are you using baking soda in the garden as a pest and disease control method and so no I'm not I'm actually not really doing anything in my garden for pest control other than encouraging the uh, the life in my garden and having healthy plants and healthy soil and then growing everything so you can see in my garden right now i just i'm just so happy with my garden so i have flowers growing all around my garden space and i've got some more back here and i've got some more on this side and uh back over here I have a whole bunch of, of herbs and all of this, not most of this back over here are weeds and native plants that are actively growing. And so I have a whole bunch of different plants, varieties of all different types. And I've got ladybugs and lace wings and ladybugs and lace wings are great for helping keep stink bugs and white flies under control. I've got the birds, I've got all kinds of life in my garden, so I don't need to worry about anything else. Now, baking soil can disrupt the pH on 
plants if you use it as a spray uh, and it, it can also affect the soil to some degree if you use a lot of it and it's, it rolls down into the soil so I, I really haven't used baking soda it can be used as a remedy for powdery mildew but it's not one of those things that that I have a big issue with even my powdery mildew issue because I have air circulation around my plants like I talked about earlier powdery mildew isn't a big issue so uh, no sim just a simple no I'm not doing any of that for pest control and disease control because I'm focused on the soil being healthy to promote the healthy plants and a healthy plant can fight off those pests and those diseases pretty easily and so it takes time it takes a few years to actually reach this point but but it it can easily be attained if you just follow that nice progression all those videos I make that show you how I do it and I I, I, I saw my garden this week and my garden only looks like this for a brief period of the year because my season is so short but you can see these leaves. I, I took all the shade cloth off and I took all the covers I had off a few weeks ago. But you can see there's, there's no pests, no disease. None of these leaves are eaten. And it's because of that overall philosophy of everything working together to keep the whole system balanced. Now, some of the leaves just behind me, you can't see it, where I've been harvesting some of... Uh, my lettuce and some of the turnips and some of the beets. Yes, the leaves have been eaten a little bit. There are small holes in the leaves. Doesn't affect the flavor. They still cook and eat the same, whether it's got a hole in it or not. But the plants are healthy and the plants are looking great. And I know so many of you and 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 many YouTubers right now, video creators, are having issues in their garden because of the heat and because of the weird weather and because of all the things that are going on. And I'm dealing with that too. But with the protection I put over my plants, the hail cloth, the focus on the soil, all those other things, I, I am proud to show off my garden. It's one of those things when you are making videos for gardeners, to help them become a better gardener like I do, it helps to actually have a garden that looks pretty good. So yes, I'm bragging, I'm showing off because I can only do this for a brief period of time before the, ha the hail comes or the frost comes and kills all the plants. And so I'm enjoying it a lot, but I wanted to show you that it can be done with a step-by-step -step process. And so, during the summer, or for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, during the winter, I think it's a great time to stop and think about the successes in your garden. Too often we wait until the end of the season and then think, what was it that we did that worked? And half the time you forget it, especially if you're not keeping a, a garden journal. It's better to look a garden today. I just took this picture this morning to look at the, your garden today and say what's what's going right and so I'm looking at my garden today and saying there's a lot that's going right you can see back here I have these trellises over the plants just these small hoops and they're working as I planned as the plants are growing they're growing up and out the trellises these cucumbers are growing up these vines like I showed in a recent video and they'll go over the top in the back here uh, are more of these are yellow squash plants there is a wire trellis just like this one underneath all of these plants so this trellis is acting as a support for the yellow squash plants as the plants grow vertically they're not flopping over on the ground which often happens with the squashes that we grow instead they're being supported by this cattle panel hoop trellis back here so I look at my garden it's like wow it's working all of these things that that I'm showing you work now granted I've been doing them for a number of years so that's why I keep doing them and I know they work 
But the first time I did it, the first time it worked, it was one of those wow moments. Now, years later, it's still a wow moment because it just helps validate the way I garden in my garden. And so I, I just, I, I went through some of the other backgrounds I had today that I was considering showing. And I thought, nope, for today's subject, this is what I need to talk about, my garden. Because things are going right. In the background here, you know, I've got the raspberries that I've been harvesting. The asparagus is doing great. The strawberries are doing great. Everything's doing great. I have tomato fruit on the vines. I'm hoping that it's going to start changing color soon. It's a little early for me, but I'm looking forward to that first tomato. But with the successes come the, not necessarily failures. Failures are just an opportunity to do something different when it comes to, to the gardening. And so I'm growing a lot of fruit bushes this year. And I had noticed that uh, some of the, the fruit bushes were getting close. So I've eaten a few currants. They're not quite ready yet. The honeyberries, I don't have any honeyberries on the plant, but the, the couple of my gooseberry plants were, were fruiting. And so I was looking forward to eating the gooseberries. And a few days ago, I'm out watering in the garden and Mala's with me and Mala's underneath the gooseberry plant. And I thought maybe she was going after a grasshopper, which she likes to do, or maybe she was trying to catch a wasp, which she also likes to do. And then I noticed that she was ducking under my gooseberry plant and then running away. She's eating my gooseberries. So I haven't even had the opportunity to enjoy my own gooseberries because my garden dog has discovered that she likes gooseberries. And this morning, she brought in one of the green tomatoes off of the plants. So my garden looks great, it's doing great, but I'm losing harvest to my dog. Now I have to figure out what the best fix is for that. You may have seen in a recent video, I've got a, a small wooden fence back here. You can just see the top of it. It's going around my pumpkins and some squash plants. That's because she was running through that area and actually digging in that bed. I had to put a fence up to keep the dog out. Those are the kind of things that if you figure it out early in the season or mid-season, you can fix it. You can deal with it so that as the season progresses, hopefully you won't have those issues. My squash plants are looking beautiful now, as I showed in, a, in the most recent video. And a lot of it's just because I put a little simple fence around that area. I may not get any gooseberries this year, but now I know for next year that I have to do something, either bird netting or a little fence around those gooseberry plants so that Mala doesn't eat them before I do. And the whole, same holds true with birds. You have to think about the netting over your birds when you first discover that they're eating your fruit if you have that problem. So those are some of the things I wanted to talk about today with, with my garden. It's just, uh, it's so nice and 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 you all know this, so nice when you can walk into the garden and see those successes. So relish every moment and learn from all of the reasons why there was a success and definitely take advantage of it. Yeah, there's David saying, got my first brandy wine yesterday. Brandy wine tomatoes are just incredible. So uh, there you go. That's exactly the kind of stuff. And so uh, look at the, look at the, the date first week of August. Look at your soil, look at your mulching, look at the rest of your plants. <clears throat> and if everything was right, this is one of those, okay, I know that I can grow brandy wines and harvest them the first week of August. And now going into the future, this is one of those those gardening lessons that you take with you. And, and that's, that's exactly the way to do it. Heidi also has a dog that eats the bell peppers right off the plant. So sometimes it's, it's, enjoyable to have your dog in the garden until your dog's in the garden. And my, uh, my first big garden here in Colorado Springs, I had to put a fence uh, in to keep the dog out. My, my beloved Shaka would, would eat the tomatoes and the bell peppers and cucumbers. Just 
I think partly because she liked the, the flavor, but just because it looks like a ball that we're going to play with. And I had to build a fence to completely fence off the garden to keep her out. And she would just sit on the outside of the fence and watch me. But it's one of those things sometimes that is what you what you have to do. Brett Lee planted squash and melons for the first time and harvested huge, the first huge one on Friday. So happy. Good for you, Brett. That's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about is is the successes, the things that are going right in the garden. And we need to definitely take advantage of it and enjoy the moment. Alejandro Macias, welcome to the garden membership. Thank you for that. And well, a couple mentions of the Facebook group. The, the channel membership has a private Facebook group. So check that out and join us and participate in all that activities as well. Yo soy Maricela saying, should I pull the roots of my plants once they're done producing? So yes, um, many of the plants we're growing, cucumbers are probably the most obvious plant that we're growing or determinant tomatoes during the summer garden. They have a relatively short life cycle. And once they stop producing, once those determinate tomatoes stop producing, they're done. Once those cucumbers start to fade and there's only one or two flowers left on the plant, they're not going to be producing anymore after that point. So absolutely, go ahead and pull those plants, open up that space. And last week we were talking about doing a fall garden. If you do it now, you've still got time probably in almost uh, most of the areas that we're we're gardening in right now that we're actively gardening, you still have time to grow the lettuce and the Swiss chard and the spinach and the radishes and all those cool season plants that can grow into autumn without any difficulty. So yeah, absolutely. I would consider pulling the roots. Uh, I, I harvested my garlic a few weeks ago. That bed is wide open and now it's got seeds growing in it for a, a complete uh, set of new plants and new harvest and I'm in the process of creating that video on succession planting how you do that exact thing the plants from one phase of your season are done get rid of them you don't you don't need to keep them in the ground use that space for more plants for the next phase of your garden season and you can definitely extend what you're doing Dusty's wondering should we stop fertilizing once the plants producing so it depends. So I, oh, and that's another thing I wanted to talk about. This beautiful garden, zero fertilizer. I'm not using any fertilizer in my garden at all because I focus on the soil. So if you know your soil is deficient in the macronutrients, then yes, fertilization is probably necessary. And depending on the fruit, you may want to fertilize usually at the beginning of the fruiting process because that fruit is going to take a lot of nutrients to develop and so the plant needs those nutrients so near fruiting is usually a time to apply fertilizer but <coughs> you have to be careful about the fertilizer because the fruit development is more reliant on phosphorus and potassium, the P and the K of the NPK. If you use a high nitrogen fertilizer, the nitrogen is used for new growth and for leaf growth. So if you use a balanced fertilizer or a high nitrogen fertilizer, not a good idea to do that during the fruiting time because what you're going to be doing is promoting the new plant growth the new leaf development at the expense of the fruit development. So if your soil is deficient, if you need fertilizer, focus on a fertilizer that has higher numbers in the second and third number and a lower number on the first number. Or as I do, if you know your soil is healthy and you've been working to improve your soil over a period of time, then you may not need fertilizers at all. And so, yes, you can definitely stop fertilizing after the plant is producing. And so you can see all these flowers. And I've and this last week, great week, I, I harvested my first zucchini, I harvested my first yellow squash, 
and they're beautiful they're doing great the plants are loaded with more fruit and i haven't used any fertilizer because i amended the soil last fall in some of the beds i amended the soil in the spring and and that's what you need to to do to really support your plant is to have the soil healthy enough to give everything that you need shandy's garden says my two-year blueberry plants gave me like five berries max there may be 18 inches now from bare root stark brothers still in containers thought that was best even using berry tone suggestions wait wait till next year three years is typical for most fruiting bushes and so uh, five berries in a, on a two-year plant that's awesome i would say next year as long as if they're in containers so this is a situation that i use fertilizer is in containers that are primarily a potting mix where where it's a confined environment and i'm not amending the soil every year i'll use fertilizer in these conditions so berry tone great idea but give it a year two years is a bit early uh, and stark brothers tends to send very young plants especially their uh, their bare roots and so of my fruit bushes the ones that are doing the best right now are from Fedco, which is a main company. They ship bigger plants. My Stark Brothers plants are about a year behind the Fedco, and they're taking longer to catch up because, in my experience at least, Stark Brothers plants are just smaller, less established root system in the bare roots, and it takes longer for them to, to produce the fruit. So uh, give it another year, and... Uh, Hopefully next year you'll see more than five berries, and I think everything should be uh, better at that point. Uh, okay, let's see. Mornings at the allotment has cats. There's really not much I can do to keep them out except cage the whole plot and allotment, as they call it in the UK, which we're not allowed to do because it's not wildlife friendly. Yeah, cats. Uh, I had the wild cat roaming the area. My last garden, I had some cats in the neighborhood that like to use my garden beds for their litter box, which is not a fun experience if you garden without wearing gloves. But uh, that's one of those things. Sometimes you, you might be able to put uh, like a wire mesh on top of the mulch. And that rough surface can deter the cats. They definitely won't dig. And if they're crawling across the bed and there's a wire mesh on top, they're going to find another area. So. Maybe that is something that might be able to help you out a little bit in dealing with cats. But other than that, there, yeah, there really isn't a whole lot that you can do. Uh, Lisa's wondering, any ideas why my squashes aren't getting any bigger? Plants look healthy, but the squash are remaining tiny and only one on the plant. Uh, it could be, again, the plant needs to get big enough to support the fruit and then give the fruit it, the growth it needs, consistent water, nutrients in the soil. But squash are one of those things that, that they, they're funny. You know, you'll see these little squashes and they, they look like they stay small for a few days. And then suddenly overnight, they just explode and they get bigger. So this is another one of those to have a little bit of patience. And hopefully you'll see a lot of uh, growth uh, once, once the plant and the sun and the water and everything catches up the squashes should start producing. Like I said, this is just the first week that I've had squashes uh, that was reaching the point that I could harvest it. And it happened pretty quickly. It seems like just over a week ago, there was barely anything. And now my, my plants are completely covered. So give it a few days and probably it'll be okay. The hardest thing is the flower and the fertilization of the flower and then the development of the fruit. Once the fruit's on the plant, uh, that, that's almost the easy part because the, the plant really begins to take over at that point. So, okay, scrolling down. I know I'm behind in some of the comments. So I'm trying to catch up. <coughs> Mike Watson's wondering, should I mow my field peas and turn them into the ground or just pull them up? How does their nitrogen fixation work? And so you can just mow them and or plow them into the ground. The way the nitrogen fixation works, there's... There's a, a very specific bacteria in the soil that works in conjunction with the plant. 
And so there are nodules on legumes of which the field peas are, which it's a great cover crop. And those nodules will, in conjunction with the bacteria, take the nitrogen that the plant is absorbing and localize it within those nodules. <clears throat> and so the, the nitrogen is coming from the air, it's going through the plant, and, and that, that re relationship between the type of plant and the bacteria and the nodules, they'll actually enlarge, and that's where the nitrogen is. And so if you dig up your field peas, you'll see these little white nodules on the roots, and that's the nitrogen. That's where the nitrogen is being fixed to the plant. And so if you cut your field peas, and this holds true with, with most legumes, if you cut them before they flower, that nitrogen will be fixed on the roots and it's now available for the soil. If you let your legumes flower, and then like with peas, develop the pod, the plant is going to end up using most, if not all of that nitrogen, because that's why the plant has developed that, that mechanism. It's usually uh, for a legume that naturally will grow in soil that is low in nitrogen. And so the plant has developed a way to accumulate its own nitrogen because the soil is, is lacking. And so the plant is going to use that nitrogen from those nodules to produce its growth and then the flowers and the fruit. And so cut, it, the cutting, mowing, great idea before flowering. And then you can just either leave the roots in the ground because the nitrogen is under the soil surface and then it will gradually be uh, eaten and moved throughout the soil by soil microorganisms. And then allow the mowed material to stay on top as a mulch to help protect the soil. That's the easiest way to do it. Or you can turn the whole thing into the soil so that you're adding that mowed top material into the soil as more organic matter. So a couple different ways to work, but yeah, that's how the nitrogen fixation works. It's all happening in the roots, uh, which is why the top part isn't needed as part of that activity. Hi, Jessica, another new member of the Gardner Scott community on the membership tag. And if you want to join, you can see that join button below or you can actually see the link in the description below. So nice to see you. Hope to see you on the Facebook group. And, and depending on which level of membership you are, uh, every month we've got private live chats and there's lots of other various perks that you, you can see uh, if you're thinking about joining. So that's fantastic. Uh, okay, let's see. Linda had to build two by two frames with wire mesh to keep cats out of the garden. There you go. It's that wire mesh is is a pretty effective method so i'm glad you're using that Masabi gal is wondering my fruit my friend told me i needed two different blueberries to get fruit i've got two different ones this spring and wow i've had lots of berries awesome yes this this is one of those those tricks even though it's really not a trick there are there are quite a few plants that we grow that will benefit from two plants two different plants so the the tomatillos that i'm growing in this hoop behind me right here, they're on the back side. I've got two tomatillo plants. Blueberries are the same way, two blueberry plants. There are many of the things we're growing in our garden that if you have two, you'll have way more fruit than if you just have one. And it's just the way the pollination works in those kind of plants that they really need to have that, that other plant to provide the, the extra pollen for them to to uh, produce the maximum amount of fruit. So good for you. Uh, I think that's another great tip to grow multiple plants of, of almost anything. If you're growing anything that fruits, have multiple plants. And in most cases, you'll get more fruit because you've got more plants. And, and it's, it's, it's more than just a math thing. It's, it's like if you had one plant Let's say it would give you 10 berries. 
Now, if you had another plant, it would grow 10 berries. But you grow those two plants together so they can pollinate each other, and each plant will have 20 berries. I mean, it's that kind of craziness. It's not a direct correlation like that, but that's the concept that, that you'll get more fruit when you've got the multiple plants. So great idea. Glad to hear that. Yankee Sister Homestead on a Monday. My week is complete. Had to restart plants due to groundhogs. All are doing well now. Good. I'm glad I remember you talking about that previously. Planted in pots closer to the house with extra fencing, not giving up. Definite thumbs up. That is a success. And that's something I'm glad you shared with us because that is something that don't give up. Like in the very beginning, we're talking about don't be discouraged. Things go wrong. You figure out how to fix it. You analyze it and come up with the solution and you move forward. So good for you to have lost plants and had to figure out a method like pots and extra fencing. And now you've got some that are doing well now. So good for you. And thank you for that contribution. Always nice to see you here on Mondays. And so Janet McDonald says, um, Fedco has good hand tools, stark fruit trees. I've had good bare root fruit trees from Ison's nursery. I haven't done anything from the Southeast for low chill hours. I have a lot of, I have high chill hours, so I haven't had to do any Southeast nurseries, but thank you for that suggestion. And Muscadine grapes are another great one that a lot of people can grow. So thank you, Janet. I haven't checked them out. <coughs> if you live in a warmer region, check out Ison's nursery. Uh, for those of us that are in colder areas, Fedco and Stark Brothers are the ones that tend to give us those fruit trees and fruit bushes that are are really, well, they're being grown in cold areas. And so those of us that have harsh winters, those are the, the companies that, that tend to um, get a lot of our business because they're the ones that are, are supplying us with our needs. Yogi Lai replanted pink celery three times this year. Worth it. Beautiful harvest. I'm guessing the pink celery came from Baker Creek Seeds. That's one of their specialties. But there you go. Sometimes you got to do it over and over again. And especially for something like pink celery, which is a, a really beautiful plant and can give a good harvest. So excellent. Not giving up and having a big harvest as a result of it. So, okay. Yo soy Maricela saying, is it a bad practice to water your plants in the afternoon? So I, I did a video a few weeks ago that talked about common mistakes with gardening. And in that video, I talk about that you should try to avoid watering in the afternoon. And I give a few reasons for it. The primary one being that the water evaporates in the heat and it it is a waste of water. However, if the soil is bone dry and the plants are suffering, it's, it's better to water in the afternoon than to not water at all. It's normal for plants to wilt during the afternoon. That's just part of their normal process. Those cells in the leaves, those stomata that control the transpiration, which is actually the release of, of water vapor and and uh, the air, primarily oxygen, that the plant is creating. The stomata open, which allows all of the gases and the water vapor to escape. But during the day, because of the heat in, and the more often dry air, that transpiration can run out of control and the plant can lose too much moisture during that process. So the leaves shut down those cells. The stomata just closes completely. And so the result is because you don't have that, that vapor flowing up through the plant, that's what causes the plants to be erect. They're, they're turgid because of that transpiration process. When that stops, the plants wilt and that's normal. And then as soon as the conditions cool down again, those stomata cells open up, the plant becomes erect again and the transpiration continues and everything is wonderful as far as the plant is concerned. Too often, people will water in the afternoon because they see their plant wilting, and that can actually lead to an overwatering situation because the soil doesn't need any more water, and you're not helping the plant by putting more water into the soil. So those are a couple reasons why watering in the afternoon is not 
usually the best practice. It may be necessary, but I would I would suggest watering in the morning or in the evening as a better practice. Okay, let's see. So yeah, Yogi Eli says Baker Creek for that pink celery. And uh, that's one of those things Jer, who's the, the owner of Baker Creek, has been very proud of. And uh, I, I interviewed him in a video a while back. And I think he actually was talking about the pink celery in that video because he's very, very proud of it. It is a cool plant. Eggnog brownies. My mom sent me a drip irrigation kit specifically for my tomato bed. Might put some in my pollinator bed too. Awesome. So there you go. That's one of those things that uh, be be glad for, especially if if your mother's sending you drip irrigation. She knows that you like gardening and she knows some good ideas to help out with that gardening. There's a success right there. That's definitely something to, to enjoy. Barry's wondering, is it possible to grow ginger root on a large scale in Ohio? I would say it's possible. Uh, ginger during the summer can grow in most places. I, I would say in Ohio, depends on when your first frost hits and whether that's a long enough season to grow the ginger on a large scale. You would probably be better suited to do it in a greenhouse. And so I would say in a greenhouse, you could probably have some pretty good success in Ohio with ginger on a large scale. But uh, there's, there's a lot more to growing the ginger plant than just sticking it in the soil and, and watering it. And so uh, look into that a little bit more. The temperature, it's, it's pretty finicky as to how low a temperature it can handle. And so you want the root development. Well, to get the root development, you need the plant development. And the plants are going to be affected adversely by extremes in temperature, which is why in a greenhouse where you might be able to control the temperature a little bit better, that's a much better likelihood. I, I'm not aware that Ohio is known for its ginger crops. And there's a good reason for that. For most, Colorado isn't known for its ginger crops because our weather just doesn't support the normal growing of ginger without that additional protection and that uh, that additional temperature control. So uh, that's something to think about. Okay, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm catching up again, scrolling down. Uh, so Prepper Chris is wondering, is it normal for a seedling leaves to wilt and drop in the middle of summer? <clears throat> and so it's normal uh, to a certain degree for the leaves to wilt. But as far as dropping, it's the seedling. Is, like we were talking earlier about the, the tomatoes and the pepper leaves, those lower leaves yellowing and dropping. So on a seedling, those very first two leaves, the cudledon leaves, those are the, the ones that first emerge from the, lead, from the seed. Those leaves, yes, completely normal for those to yellow and drop off as the true leaves are growing. And so if that's what's happening, a little bit of wilting because of the heat, dry soil can cause that. Those first two leaves dropping off, absolutely normal. But if the seedling is not growing and more of those lower leaves are falling off, then that is not normal. And that that could be an issue with the nutrients in the soil. It could be contamination of the soil. It could be over or under watering. There are lots of reasons why a seedling could wilt and leaves to drop if it's more than just those, those first two. But the middle of the summer is, is also a big reason. It's the heat, which is why uh, many gardeners aren't actively putting seeds in in the middle of summer because the seedlings are just suffer from it. So when I when I start my fall garden like I am now, I will try to put shade cloth on hoops over my germinating seeds and those young seedlings so that they don't get baked in the sun and wilt and lose leaves and and start their life off suffering rather than starting their life off with a, a strong seedling developing. So take a look at that. If you don't have protection over the plants and those young seedlings are in the full sun, that, that could be a big issue, absolutely.
So, uh, okay, so nice to see everybody talking back and forth. Pam's wondering, what's your biggest growing achievement this season? Um, so that's a really good question. I'm just so happy with everything in my garden. And so I would say right now, so you can see back here, those are my pepper plants. And I, I'm, I'm growing, uh, I, I always grow hot peppers, but I don't grow sweet peppers outside very often because again, the, the harsh weather of summer I've noticed has been harder on my sweet pepper plants than on my, my hot pepper plants. And so what I did this year in this bed back here that's covered with this same cattle panel trellis. So in the front right here are hot peppers. Then I have some sweet peppers and then I have some cucumbers in that bed. And I had shade cloth over this whole area. So if you look really close, you can see these pepper plants are really tall. They're doing great. And then there's a little bit of a gap here. Well, those are the sweet peppers and they're doing great too because I covered them with shade cloth when the plants were still pretty small right after transplanting and when I was getting extremely hot days. And so I think that's my biggest achievement because I, I recognized in the past that I had a problem with that type of plant, analyzed it, tried to figure out what could I do differently this year for that specific plant, did it, and it's working. And so those pepper plants have flowers and they're setting fruit. And I took the shade cloth off because our temperatures have dropped a little bit and it's not as harsh as it was. And I'm, I'm extremely happy with the way my peppers are growing this year. So the last few years, uh, let's see, last year I grew a lot of cayenne peppers and jalapeno peppers and a few other different types of hot peppers and that was it this year i'm growing way more pepper varieties and just having success across the board so that's that's what i would contribute as my my biggest success this year but overall i'm just so happy with the way my garden is looking that uh there's i can't really think of something that i'm disappointed in I mean, I, I don't have years like this very often. If you've watched my videos over the years, you've seen those videos where I talk about what can go wrong and I show my garden after it's been devastated by hail. And this year has just been a, a great year. So that's why I wanted to show off today. SJK, do I continue watering my beans, lettuce, and kale as I wait for their seed pods to finish developing and fully dry out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so if you're saving seeds, the the seed in those pods still needs to develop it needs to mature and it requires energy for that to happen so it's still taking energy from the plant and so the plant needs to stay alive to to provide that development of the seed and so it's not that the seed pod dries out and that's what leads us to, to have good seed. It's that the seeds have fully matured. And when they reach that full maturity, then the plant is done with it. The seed pods dry out, then we harvest the seeds, and then we start it all over again. So yes, keep the plant alive by watering it, treating it like you normally would. It probably won't require as much water as when it's in the fully active phase of growing, but it, you do need to still water all of those plants to, to develop the seed pods. And that, that holds true with, with all the plants that we're growing for the purpose of saving seeds. So thank you for that super chat. Thank you for that contribution. And <clears throat> especially in Wisconsin. So it can be hard for those of us that have a short growing season we talked to, I talked earlier about pulling plants so you can free up space to have a fall garden. It can be hard when we're saving those plants and, and waiting for those seed pods to mature because we're, we're, we're not wasting the space, but, but it's, 
It's space that's not being used to grow another plant. And there's still time in the season to grow another plant. So what I might suggest, I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago, go ahead and if you if you want to do a fall garden where you have the beans and the lettuce and the kale, go ahead and put those seeds in now, right next to the plants that you're waiting for the seed development. Now, when you harvest the seed pods, when they're dry and completely mature, cut down the beans and the kale and the lettuce, and those little seedlings should be right there ready to take over because you've put the seeds in now. And so you won't have wasted the space. You'll still be able to get another harvest. It's just right now, the plants are taking up the space where normally you might have just pulled a plant and put new seeds in for that late garden. So I hope that helps a little bit. <coughs> okay, let's see, garden, or CC is saying I have a similar question about turmeric as uh, ribosomes. Uh, as the other had question about ginger root in Michigan. Same true for turmeric, yeah. Uh, ginger in Ohio and turmeric in Michigan. Uh, turmeric is, is a great, those rhizomes that that you grow of either the turmeric or the ginger great plants beautiful plants the roots have are just amazing properties for our health and are relatively easy to grow but very susceptible to extremes in temperature and so uh, you might be able to grow them outside in a protected area fully covered again a greenhouse is probably what i would suggest for you uh, in in Michigan just because my guess is you've got a short season like mine and those freezing conditions can just cease all the growth of you know all of those those semi-tropical and tropical plants that we don't realize where they come from the reason that they're being grown in other parts of the world is because that's where the plant does best and the reason we're not growing them in places like the northern United States is because they don't grow well there but as with banana trees and fig trees and everything else, you can grow them in northern regions as long as you understand what they need and you take the actions to, to protect them. Okay, let's see what else we have. You guys are asking some good questions today. Environmental Coffee House has a new orchard in, but drought in the way how and when to water. <coughs> so check out that video and i haven't seen uh yeah jay's usually real good about putting links to videos so i'm not sure if she has linked to that water video yet and so in that that video where i talk about problems with watering i throw in a lot of tips on when and how to water the the most important issue with all of the plants we're growing is, is consistent watering now there are some house plants there are some garden plants that that can benefit from allowing the soil to dry out between waterings. But for the most part, it's just best to look for and strive toward a consistent water level where the soil is moist. It's not wet. It's not saturated. It's not dry. It's not powdery. It's moist. And for most of the plants we're growing, that's all the plants need is it's a moist environment that provides all of that water vapor that is going through the plant with transpiration. It provides everything that the roots need to grow because the roots will grow in moist soil. They're not going to grow in dry or saturated soil. And more importantly, the soil life, all of those microbes thrive in a moist soil they don't survive if the soil is too wet or too dry and so because i focus so much on the soil life even though a plant might be okay with the soil drying out i'm not okay with the soil drying out because that affects the soil life and i want to keep the soil life happy by keeping a moist soil so as i show in that video just Dig your finger into the soil an inch or two or three or four and see what the soil moisture is. And that will determine how often you need to water. 
It might be once a day, every other day, twice a day. It varies based on the humidity and the temperature and how big the plants are because bigger plants are going to take more water than smaller plants. So physically check the soil moisture level to determine when you need to water. I, I got away pretty easily a week ago. We actually had a pretty good amount of rain. And so I went three days without watering, which is highly unusual for my dry Colorado air. But that's because we had so much rain that my soil had become saturated and stayed moist for longer than it normally does. As soon as the rain stopped, I had to go back to everyday watering. And in the beginning, I watered in the morning one day and then in the evening the next day. So about a day and a half between waterings. But now with the return of, of the, the dry conditions, I can expect that for me, it's once a day watering because that's just what my soil and my plants and my weather leads me to, to do. But as soon as we start cooling down, the plants aren't going to need as much water. The soil's not going to be as much water. And so in about a month, for me, I, I shift to watering every other day. I know that from experience. That experience comes from physically checking the soil and seeing how the plants are, are benefiting from, from the watering. So hope that helps. <coughs> so let's see, rolling down. You guys are asking a lot of stuff. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Jay, right on top of it. Uh, 10 common watering mistakes to avoid. And there's the link to that. So Chris is wondering uh, if I'm stuck using the Colorado River. I'm actually on the wrong side of the mountain. So I'm on the east side of the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado River is on the west side of the Rocky Mountains. So I'm not getting my water from the Colorado River at all. Near me is the Arkansas River. And so to the south of me, um, Frank is on from Pueblo. And so Pueblo, Colorado and and those parts of the country of the state uh, often rely on Arkansas River water. But here in Colorado or in Colorado Springs, where I'm at, we don't have any rivers to speak of. And the the water that we're getting is not being supplied by the river. It, most of it is coming from the aquifers and uh, the aquifers are fed by snow melt and some of the, the rivers, but uh, no, definitely not the Colorado. Um, I'm too far away from that. D Birdwell, thank you so much for that super sticker. Nice to see you here. I appreciate the contribution and that donation. Thank you so much. Yogi Lai spreads coffee grounds around my blueberries. Don't know if it does anything, but they're happy plants. So the coffee grounds aren't adding any uh, acidity. They're not changing the pH, but it's organic matter. And it's, it's like spreading any organic matter on your soil. Your soil is going to be happy because it's got food to eat. And the, the coffee grounds spread throughout your garden. Very common activity. I think most of the gardeners that do it don't fully understand the benefits they're providing. They might think they're changing the pH, but they're not. But it's adding all that organic matter. So the dried grass clippings, the straw, the crushed leaves that I use, coffee grounds I usually add to my compost pile. But yeah, you could easily spread the coffee grounds on the, the soil surface to get mixed in with all the rest of the mulches. They'll decay in time. They'll add nutrients to the soil and your plants will definitely be happy. So uh, I have no doubt that that's a big part of, of why the plants are doing okay is because you're taking action. I, I haven't said it in a while and I haven't worn the my shirt in a while, but my overriding philosophy for so many of these activities we do in the garden is that a good garden grows where a good gardener goes. And so if you're taking the time to spread the coffee grounds around your garden, then you're probably also taking the time to water correctly and to prune when needed and to take care of your plants the way the plants like to be taken care of. And so, so many of these tips and tricks and concoctions from the kitchen that you'd see suggested 
really don't have a lot of benefit. They just are something that works according to somebody. I think often it's not that that concoction is any better or worse than anything else we're doing in our garden. It's the fact that if you take the time to mix up one of those home remedies for your plants, then you're also taking the time to just take care of your garden in general. And so as we look at what's working and what's not working and the successes and analyze it and learn more, you may recognize that some of those things you're doing, the coffee grounds themselves may not be the big reason. It helps, but it's the fact that you are taking the time to care for your plants. It's really the reason your plants are doing well. So give yourself a pat on the back because you're doing something that is improving your garden and helping out your plants. And again, that's why I just am so happy with the way my garden is growing this year because of everything else that could be going wrong with the weather and the pests and, and everything else that we all have to encounter. It's not going wrong. And it's because I'm outside every day, usually multi multiple times a day, filming, caring for my plants, planning the things I'm going to do. You put all that stuff together and a good garden grows where a good gardener goes. Spend time in your garden and you can expect that your plants are going to grow better because you're you're paying attention to them. And I, I don't know that they know that I'm walking through the garden, but but if you believe in the positive energy of the universe and you've got that positive energy as you're walking through your garden, then your plants are going to soak it up. And and it's, you know, why not take advantage of that if you can? <coughs> I, I actually have some videos planned for the future where I talk some about that and some of the gardening methods that rely on that energy in the universe for our plants and planting under the moon and a lot of those other kind of things that that a lot of gardeners practice some of those methods. Again, I don't think it's necessarily that method that's causing the results that because you're 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 filling a sheep's bladder with a, a particular ingredient and burying it on the summer solstice that that's causing your garden to do better because it's drawing in the universe's energy i think it's just because you're taking the time to do those kind of actions it's all the biodynamics here's some homework for you Look up biodynamic gardening and you'll see some of these methods. The, the, the gardeners who practice biodynamic gardening love it. They say it works. There isn't a lot of scientific evidence to back that up, but that doesn't matter. It works for them. And I think it's because they're taking the time and energy to do those particular activities in addition to all those normal things that all of us do. They're just doing a lot more of it, which is why their gardens are, are doing so great with the biodynamic principles. So <clears throat> I, if it's positive energy that I can give my plants, I will definitely give my plants that positive energy. It doesn't hurt me. It actually helps me in the long run. That's the way I like to look at it. Okay, let's see. Brian saying this year is no different than others. New problems, solutions, and successes. There you go. <clears throat> I like that. That's a good way to approach it. Every year is the same. The, the individual events along the way are going to be different, but if you approach gardening like Brian does with new problems and new solutions and new successes, that'll get you out in the garden and that'll actually give you some of those, those things you can brag about. I don't like to brag too often. I, I usually just let my videos speak for themselves, but I really am just so ecstatic. This is the best garden I've had in years and everything is coming together pretty well so um and kathy says interested in planting by the moon <coughs> still learning so um, i'm planning that video to be one of my winter videos where i can't be outside in my garden because it doesn't look like this and so hopefully i'll i'll have that video where i talk about biodynamic gardening and moon planting and all those things in the months ahead so uh it's 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 fun it's i i don't 
I don't want to sound or be critical of any gardening method if it works for that gardener. That's what it's all about. And there are some very interesting techniques practiced all over the world. And some of them have been practiced for centuries. And they still don't have any scientific evidence to say that that technique works any better than another. But gardeners are doing it. It works for them. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Whatever works for you in your garden is what you should be doing for you in your garden. So there's Jay on top of it again. A holistic, ecological, and ethical approach to farming, gardening, food, and nutrition. And so thank you for that link. Yeah, look, check into biodynamics. It's, it really is interesting. And even without the scientific research, uh, it might give you some ideas about some things of, of how you can uh, do things in the garden. And, and I think a lot of it is just the philosophical aspect. And that's what I've taken from biodynamics is just developing a philosophy of how to garden, how I garden. And I've benefited from that over the years. <clears throat> and so I've also benefited. Uh, this, this leads to this last little bit I want to share with you. So the last few days had, had some big milestones on the Gardener Scott channel. I had two videos that reached one million views. Now, they're completely different videos, and I've been waiting. I've been watching for these videos. So the first one is my video on how to make sauerkraut, which I did 10 years ago. It was one of the very first videos I did. I was still learning this whole YouTube thing. Made the video. It's still a pretty good video. I, I, I use the USDA methods for making sauerkraut and show that in the video. And it took 10 years to reach 1 million views. It was my first successful video. And about six years ago, it was the only video I had that was receiving any views. And that was what really got me prompted was, wow, there's a lot of people watching this How to Make Sauerkraut video. Maybe I should make more videos. <laughs> and I did. And here I am today. 10 years to reach a million views. Blows my mind that I have a video on how to make sauerkraut that has a million views. It's just crazy. The other video I made two years ago. It's about the hoops. How, how to make different types of hoops for your garden beds. It reached a million views in two years. Completely different type of video. I'm also very proud of that video. It's one of my favorite videos. As my videos go, I think that's one of my better ones for showing new gardeners how to do something in the garden. So love that video and I'm glad that it, it reached the million viewpoint. But as I look at those two videos side by side, completely different topics, completely different timelines for how it took so long to reach a million for the sauerkraut and how quickly it took the hoop video to reach a million views. I can't help but correlate it to our plants that we're growing and our own successes within our gardens. There are some things we do that just take time. And over time, it'll be successful. You may not think it's going to happen, but it will happen. And fruit trees, in some of the questions that we've talked about today, with be it blueberries or any other type of plant. Sometimes it just takes time for the plant to be ready to give you what it is you want from that plant. The plant's not gonna grow any faster just because you want to harvest it. The plant's going to take its own sweet time to grow. You can help it out, you can give it the good soil, you can give it all the good growing conditions, you can baby it, but the plant's going to take as long as the plant needs to develop. And then there are other things we do in our garden that just seem to work overnight. It's, it's those kind of things that we're used to having patience or needing patience. We're used to things going wrong. We're used to the insect pest. We're used to all of those things happening. And then there's this other thing that we just try for the first time and it's hugely successful to the point that maybe it modifies everything we do with gardening after that point. And so I use those two vi videos as examples that one took a long time, one took a short amount of time, but they were 
different. They were different, different topics at different times. And that's the way gardening works. One part of the season, we might have better success than another part of the season. One of our plants may do much better than another one of our plants. We may have complete failure in one section of our garden and absolute success in another area of our garden. So accept that, relish that, and use that as a way for you to become a better gardener, to think about the successes mid-season, what's happening right now that I can learn from because I still have time to modify how I garden if I want to modify. Or in the middle of winter, start looking at what your next season is going to be and how you can modify your gardening behaviors based on what went wrong and what went right in your garden in the previous season. I've said this in videos before. Every day I learn something from the garden because every day I'm looking to learn something from the garden. So let that be something for you today. Don't focus on everything that's going on. There's just too much to absorb. Instead, go to your garden and just say, what am I going to learn today? And it could be that a sparrow is stealing seeds from the bird feeder to feed to its young. Wow, I didn't know that. That was something new. It could be that your dog is eating all of your fruit. Didn't know that either. Whatever it is today, pick at least one thing that you hadn't noticed before, that you didn't know about, and now that can change how you approach tomorrow and every day after that. So always great to see you here on a Monday. And of course, I'll be back next Monday to do this all over again because Gardening is just so cool, and this is a great way to start your gardening week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.